U.S. ferocity against Iran. Despite having failed to bring Iran to its knees in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, war hawks at the helm of the U.S. are stepping up their maximum pressure campaign against Tehran. The anti-Iran scheme is spearheaded by a notorious war hawk, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who has always dreamed of regime change in the Muslim country. Good afternoon. This is the second time I've, I've had someone interrupt a speech on this topic, and I, 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 remind, I, reminded, I reminded them all uh, that it would be wonderful, that it would be a wonderful thing if they could protest like that in, their, in the country of Iran. Pompeo has been leading the U.S. anti-Iran policies up to this day when Tehran is grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic and simultaneously suffering from the brutal and illegally imposed U.S. sanctions. The U.S. military also keeps raising tensions in the Persian Gulf as Iranian forces remain watchful in the face of any provocative or aggressive move. Well, many countries, including uh, you know, Britain and, and France, have called for the, the end of the sanctions for humanitarian reasons because uh, there's no point in punishing the people of, of Iran and other countries for pursuing you know, their own national policies and pursuing, pursuing their and protecting their, their independence. But you know, the United Nations has made strong calls for lifting of sanctions, even now, and even prominent politicians in the United States have called for the, the lifting of sanctions. And you know, Russia, China, the, the international community, the United Nations itself, uh, you know, the World Health Organization, you know, uh, probably every single charity but they're being not listened to. The U.S. is claiming that Washington has not quit the Iran nuclear deal and technically remains a participant state. The scheme is aimed at using a mechanism embedded within the accord to make the U.N. restore a previously lifted arms embargo on Tehran. The U.N. Security Council Resolution 2231 is very clear. We don't have to, we don't have to declare ourselves a participant. UN Security Council Resolution 2231 is un unambiguous, where the United States is a participant in the in the UN Security. It's just there in the language. There's nothing magic about this. There's no fancy. I, someone suggested this is fancy lawyering. It's just reading. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's unambiguous, and the rights that accrue to uh, participants under UN Security Council Resolution are fully available to all those participants. A prohibition on purchase of conventional arms is set to expire in October, and the U.S. top diplomat is attempting to make sure that does not happen. The former CIA chief's argument that the U.S. is still a participant in the JCPOA reveals the depth of Washington's double policies in the Trump era as the president personally signed an executive order to withdraw the U.S. from the Iran nuclear deal unilaterally. It really... It doesn't make any sense what they're saying. It just gives them an excuse to try to maintain their 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 military and their naval presence in in the region. And you know, Iran is is quite capable. There are no threats other than, of course, the threat posed by the Americans to the countries in the area and how they are trying to prop up uh, feudal regimes like Saudi Arabia, you know, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and uh, you know, to a lesser extent, Kuwait. But these are again feudal dictatorships. And it's the Americans, I think, are, are, are pursuing a very limited short-term policy. Washington's anti-Iran sentiments are also directed towards other world countries cooperating with Tehran. With the world countries engaged in fighting the coronavirus, Washington is rebuffing international calls to end the inhumane sanctions. The U.S. top diplomat has even called on Britain, France and Germany to use their ability to force the snapback of all UN sanctions on Tehran. The failures of the Iran nuclear deal are legion. One of them is now upon us. It's now just several months out, where China, Russia, other countries from around the world can all sell significant conventional weapon systems to the Iranians in October of this year. This isn't far off. This isn't some fantasy by, the, by conservatives. This is a reality. 
Uh, I think the world realizes that's a mistake. We're urging our E3 partners to take action, which is within their capacity to do. We'll, go to the, we'll work with the UN Security Council to extend that prohibition on those arms sales. Uh, and then in the event we can't get anyone else to act, the United States is evaluating every possibility about how we might do that. Pompeo is claiming that the U.S. will seek all the ways possible to restore the UN Security Council arms embargo on Iran. Iran's allies, China and Russia, are certain to oppose an extension of sanctions. The U.S. wants to ironically argue that Iran has violated the nuclear deal, while in reality, Washington was the one that quit the agreement. Now, in order to avoid Chinese or Russian vetoes at the UN Security Council, the U.S. is adopting a bogus participant status. For the agreement to be operational, it needs the agreement of both parties. And of course, the United States has, has voided that. Therefore, in terms of the Americans, the agreement is, is null and void. There's no standing in law and is unenforceable. The United States has renewed a waiver for Iraq to continue importing electricity from Iran but this time has shortened the period to only 30 days in an attempt to intimidate the two neighbors. The U.S. has spared no effort to harm friendly ties between Tehran and Baghdad, but to no avail. Iraqis depend on Iranian companies for many items, from food to machinery, electricity and natural gas. The challenge was, uh, that hit us was the um, first was the protests, in, in October last year, in 2019. And then the, that the fact that the, the government was forced to resign, uh, that um, made us lose a lot of executive authority to move on continuing and, and implementing or signing uh, the necessary contracts. As the coronavirus pandemic continues, reconstruction of Iraq has slowed down years after the US invasion. Today, the country has to be concerned about energy shortages due to U.S. hegemonic adventurism in West Asia, which even aims to eliminate the entrance of Chinese and European firms to the country. Exploiting the situation, so you have to look at what the Americans are doing, not what they're saying. Their rhetoric is one thing, but uh, their, uh, their actions say a completely different thing, that they are in fact using ISIS to provide a pretext to stay in the region, and to destabilize the region, and this is certainly has created a backlash with Iraq, where Iraq has demanded that the Americans uh, vacate their illegal occupation of the country. It was a, a, a unanimous decision of the Iraqi parliament uh, to demand that they leave. And the Americans have withdrawn from a few bases, but uh, they are still trying to maintain their, their uh, foothold in, in Iraq. Washington is also pressing other world states to decry Iran's merely peaceful missile program after the country launched a satellite into space successfully. Iran's Islamic Revolution Guards Corps, the IRGC, surprised the world by the launch, which ended up being successful despite the United States' economic terrorism. The launch drew the anger of the U.S. authorities and their allies in the region, such as Israel. Pompeo even went as far as calling on world nations to go to the United Nations and evaluate whether this missile launch was consistent with Security Council Resolution 2231. Russia, meanwhile, officially announced that the deployment does not violate any UN resolutions. Tehran also censured the US flimsy reading of the resolution. The Security Council has sort of endorsed the, the agreement, the JCPOA, but that's not the same thing as is it being in, in binding force. It's like they say, oh, this is a good agreement. Let's see how it works. But as I said, the United States has withdrawn from it. Therefore, the, the agreement is null and void as far as the United States. But they can't have their sort of cake and eat it, too. You can't say, oh, we withdrew, withdrew from the agreement. We don't honor what we had actually made arrangements for to loosen the sanctions. Yet at the same time, they're trying to impose uh, restrictions, which are actually not even part of the JCPOA on Iran, which of course, you know, only makes, uh, in my opinion, Mr. Pompeo look, uh, you know, sort of in, in embarrassing himself. The U.S. imperialist approach would not be complete without attempts to raise tensions with Iran in the Persian Gulf. Trump has even threatened to destroy Iranian boats in the Persian Gulf. 
Tehran has warned the United States not to test its resolve in the strategic waterway, maintaining that it will respond to any U.S. aggression firmly. The Americans should know that this Gulf is the Persian Gulf. The name of this Gulf is not the New York Gulf, is not the Washington Gulf, it is the Persian Gulf. So, as the name suggests, uh, this waterway it is pretty obvious and also the nation which lives next to this waterway this nation has been living and has been protecting has been living next to and has been protecting this waterway so the Americans uh, should not hatch plots day by day against the Iranian nation the tensions are part of Trump's psychological war on Iran aimed at scoring points to buy more votes in the upcoming 2020 presidential election. The illegal and aggressive American presence in the Persian Gulf, meanwhile, continues to cause insecurity in the region. Destabilization is the presence, the American presence in, in the area, plus some of their, you know, very, very aggressive actions, like, you know, assassination of, of General Soleimani. So, you know, if the Iranian Navy was was uh, was sailing around the Gulf of Mexico or just off the coast of the United States and California or near Washington, the Americans would be going crazy. But there is no real threat there except that they need some sort of uh, fig leaf to cover their 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 presence in the area when that in fact is the threat to to the regions, to Iran, but also to the other countries, uh, you know, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen for starters. So any country that is not bowing to the American dictates of the United States. Don't listen to Trump. President Trump's comments about the coronavirus are sparking backlash, given his inclination to spread disinformation and at times undermine the guidelines put in place by his own administration in order to tackle the pandemic. Some U.S. officials and activists are calling on the nation not to listen to his advice at all. So I ask Bill a question that probably some of you are thinking of if you're totally into that world, which I find to be very interesting. So supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And I think you said that has him in check, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Being the president makes Trump's comments significant to the economy and the market, so his disinformation could have harmful impacts on the nation with regards to COVID-19. The president seems to care only about using the pandemic to forward his own agenda, involving an aggressive campaign to win the 2020 election. I don't think the USA is leading on the global response to the pandemic, you know, in, in, in one way, there's something good about this tragedy in the sense that it's getting us all to come together as a planet. You know, we don't usually work together as a planet. There's so many uh, bad reasons for war and interreligious competition or conflict. And so one good silver lining of the bad cloud of the pandemic is that we are thinking as a planet at how to fight this super virus. Poison control centers are reporting spikes in people exposing themselves to bleach and other disinfectants after Trump suggested that injecting them could be helpful in treating COVID-19. The New York City Poison Control Center reported twice the number of the exposure calls the center received compared to the same period last year in the 18 hours after Trump's widely condemned comments during a White House coronavirus task force briefing. Right, and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or 
almost a cleaning because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use medical doctors with. But it sounds it sounds interesting to me. So we'll see. But the whole concept of the light, the way it kills it in one minute, that's uh, that's pretty powerful. Trump also suggested the use of ultraviolet light, which the Department of Homeland Security is researching about. The futuristic sounding technology has created a marketing opportunity for some companies. It has also made some members of the society to try to get their hands on some UV technology, although scientists still need to do more research on it. Trump recently said that it was okay to inject bleach or Lysol disinfectant. Lysol is our one of our main brands of disinfectant. And Trump really um, feels very self-conscious about his intelligence. Uh, he wants to present as somebody who's always the smartest guy in the room. But unfortunately, he is never the smartest guy in the room. So the problem with Trump, one of the many problems with Trump is that he tries to pretend to be intelligent when he's just not intelligent. Another example is the malaria drug, which the president has been promoting as a cure for the disease, ignoring experts' opinion and scientific data, in part involving its heart risks. Trump's endorsement for ingestion of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, along with that of Fox News, made Google searches for the drugs to soar 1,000%. Is These are potentially dangerous drugs uh, they come with serious risks of cardiac problems, and they're unproven in the treatment of COVID-19. So, you know, there's no proof that they work. But what's clear from the documents I obtained is that the White House had developed a, uh, a plan that they were announcing from the podium. These drugs were a potential game changer and a cure, and behind the scenes, they scrambled to circumvent regulations and make these widely available to patients. Trump's comments have made the numbers of desperate people attempting to buy the drug spike. This is while hydroxychloroquine, which is also used to cure rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other autoimmune diseases, could in some occasions be dangerous or even deadly. That's uh, a problem when he gives bad medical advice. Some people could possibly follow it. People uh, have been uh, taking, uh, you know, medicines that they think are good medicines for COVID-19, and then they they die. Uh, you know, like hydro uh, hydrochloroxine and other things. So this this idea of injecting bleach or injecting Lysol, I mean, God forbid if somebody takes his advice uh, and they inject a toxin into their bodies. This comes amid revelations that the president listened to his friends rather than his own security and medical experts. An investigation has revealed that experts and administration officials tried to warn the president about how serious the outbreak is, but to no avail. Swayed by petty politics, Trump ignored the advice, probably thinking that he could protect his great numbers on the economy in an election year. I want to get back with or without but I want, you know, obviously we have to wait till it's gone. It will be gone. And uh, we want to be back to where we were, yes. Without a vaccine, sir, why do you think the virus will just be gone? It's gonna go, it's gonna leave, it's gonna be gone. It's gonna be eradicated. Uh, and uh, it might take longer, it might be in smaller sections. It, it'll be, it won't be what we had. And, and we also learned a lot. Again, if you have a flare up in a certain area, if you have a, I call them burning embers. Boom. We put it out. We know how to put it out now. The president's weeks of delay to take the pandemic seriously led to widespread confusion in the public and lack of effective quarantining measures. While research suggests that pandemics boost conservatives in elections, Trump is concerned that the economic recession emanating from COVID-19 could slim his chances of re-election. I think the crisis of the pandemic has really exposed a lot of the problems with Trump. And uh, hopefully they have uh, eroded enough of his base so that it's going to be impossible for, for him to win the election in November. 
uh, because I know, I know um, most Iranians see this, and a lot of Americans see this, that Trump equals nothing but machismo and war and violence and a really outdated politics, a politics based on being a bully, being uh, a patriarch. And, you know, we need equal rights. We need human rights. We need women's rights. Uh, we need a spiritual renewal across this planet. Trump is performing similarly in the global arena by isolating the United States from the international resolve to battle the coronavirus, including efforts to make a vaccine and to share research, treatment and medicines. About 20 world leaders and global health figures pledged in a virtual meeting that they would cooperate in the fight against the coronavirus even without the U.S. present. People knew it was happening and people did not want to talk about it. Many Americans are saying the exact same thing about you, that you should have warned them the virus was spreading like wildfire through the month of February instead of holding rallies with thousands of people. Why did you wait so long who you to with? warn who, them? Who you with? And why did you yeah. uh, not have social distancing until March 16th? Who are you with? I'm Lee Jia Jang with CBS News. So if you look at what I did in terms of cutting off or banning China from coming in. Chinese nationals. But by the way, not Americans who are also nice coming and from easy. China. Nice and easy. Just relax. We cut it off. People were amazed. These gentlemen, everybody was amazed that I did it. We had 21 people in a room. Everybody was against it but me. Dr. Fauci said, had I not done that, perhaps tens of thousands and maybe much more than that, people would have died. I was very early, very, very early. Trump's suspension of payments to the WHO has not only failed to undermine the UN body's resolve to take on the pandemic, but also united other nations more in the global front to get rid of this virus. The president must realize that his application of isolationism and disinformation as a defense mechanism against the coronavirus does not work. It's important for our states to get it right, because if they don't, we may be in for another round of this. Dr. Fauci said that if states lift their stay-at-home orders too soon, we could be right back in the same boat we were in a few weeks ago. And that boat, by the way, is a Diamond Princess cruise ship. I think maybe Dr. Fauci is just saying we need to stay at home so Brad Pitt will keep playing him for another six months. But meanwhile, Team Trump is declaring victory. The president's pretty little son-in-law was on Fox and Friends this morning. He said the federal government rose to the challenge and that this is a great success story. And irony is now as dead as his eyes. But that wasn't the craziest thing he said. Watch this carefully because... I really want you to look. I find this to be fascinating. Well, I think what we've seen uh, with the pandemic that's approached, there's been a lot of unforeseen challenges that we've worked hard through. Uh, this is just one of the many challenges. Uh, the team was on it. Uh, president Trump was working on it over the weekend with the Secretary of Agriculture, the Vice President, Chief of Staff Meadows, and he took strong action yesterday to make sure that the Americans will have uh, all the food supply that they need. Okay, did you get that? To make sure that the Americans will have all the food supply that they need. Let's see that again. To make sure that the Americans will have uh, all the food supply that they need. <laughs> the Americans will have all the food supply they need. If we are they, what are you? 